you are live hello all right hello everyone it's live fine okay. good evening everybody uh, today we are having a webinar on uh, cardiac uh, situations for our medical students of parul university at the on onset i would like to uh, thank parul university for giving us this opportunity to talk about uh, chest pain and uh, management of myocardial infarction we have two very eminent cardiologists with us today uh, who will be uh, talking on these topics so i would request the students please put in your queries in the chat box once they finish their talks we'll get to your queries our first speaker is dr krishna kant sharma an interventional cardiologist at tricolor hospital and baroda heart institute he will be talking on an approach to chest pain uh, chest pain will be a very common emergency attended by young interns and young medical officers so this is a very vital topic and uh, uh, dr sharma will be talking on symptom science investigations including ecg and cardiac biomarkers and uh, over to you dr sharma for your talk on an approach to chest pain okay uh, good evening everybody uh, all attendees welcome on this webinar i am uh, starting this <clears throat> the approach to chest pain okay i think i am audible to all and uh, should be going fine all these things throughout the presentation this is a talk uh, at the end of this talk i would uh, think that you sharpen your diagnostic skill you broaden your differential diagnosis and you identify the causes of chest pain which are emergency and non emergency causes and you can at least order initial investigation and evaluate that in a particular manner okay so what is chest pain's importance in uh, most of the times in emergency situations the acute chest pain is a very common symptom and globally 7 million emergencies visit annually for chest pain only and in that 20 to 30 percent are having acute coronary syndrome. What is acute coronary syndrome? We come in a, to know in subsequent slides. That is coronary ischemia, reduced blood flow to the heart, is acute coronary syndrome. And almost 65 percent of those admitted or detained for that chest pain can turn out to be non-cardiac. That is a good thing because cardiac pain is uh, somewhat dangerous. So acute coronary syndrome is a number one cause of the death world out. worldwide account for 12% to 15% of deaths and nearly 3% of acs if we not take proper history and evaluation and not retain them they are missed or discharged from the emergency so in the chest what are the organs which are responsible for pain heart aorta lung pleura esophagus stomach mediastinum musculoskeletal system lots of ribs muscles are there lots of nerves roots are there and sometimes it's related from the brain that is a psychogenic chest pain is also a part of chest pain so come to the major cardiovascular causes they are coronary artery disease structural coronary vessels are there which supply the blood supply to the heart the myocardium and that when affected by narrowing or blockage or sudden formation of clot the turn into the stable angina pectoris is one of the condition leading to chest pain unstable angina leading to chest pain and myocardial infarction leading to chest pain some tone related disorder vasomotor disorders of coronary vessels vasospasm and all that that is variant angina and microvascular angina the heart is having pericardium which is when inflamed can give rise to chest pain that is pericarditis the muscle itself inflamed and give rise to chest pain myocarditis valves because of the straining sometimes give give rise to chest pain there is aortic stenosis mitral stenosis the aorta the major vessel coming from the heart when dissected in the layers of his its wall that can also give rise to chest pain that is aortic dissection and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy one of the condition of heart muscle when the blood flow from itself pumping from the heart is obstructed by muscle itself and leading to coronary ischemia and straining type of chest pain these are the causes of cardiovascular chest pain there are lots of other chest pains gi causes skeletal muscular causes lung issues are there leading to chest pain so first of all when a chest pain comes to you in the emergency or opd 
you have to be clear that it's an emergency or non-emergency situation. So some are the causes of which are emergency are acute coronary syndrome, pulmonary embolism, aortic dissection, esophageal rupture, pneumothorax, and pneumonia. So these are the emergent conditions. And once such type of patients comes, initially you have to try then if you feel the patient is, looks very sick, the chest pain with complaint of chest pain, it's very sick, get an immediate thorough examination like pulse, blood pressure, is respiratory rate, saturation and all. And if you found there is a significant abnormal pulse, abnormal blood pressure, dyspnea, then you have to shift the patient in the emergency care or ICU. And with the starting the treatment like IV support, oxygen, monitoring, ECG, you have to evaluate further by history and examination. And you go by an emergency step like airway, breathing, circulation, vital cell examination. And by the history and examination, you can focus your examination on a particular system like cardiac, pulmonary, or vascular. So this is a condition when a chest pain with abnormal vitals, you come to come across. So now we come go by go step by step in chest pain evaluation. How can conclude the diagnosis on history and examination and uh, give some investigation profile for a particular patient. So always patient have some point to the pain. Take a good history and 50% of your work is done by history only. So whenever there is a pain, especially chest pain, the Socrates is the acronym. You can remember that you can have to take the history of sight, the position, onset, the character and quality of pain, radiation or the referred pain, associated symptoms to that pain, the timing of pain, episodic, continuous, gradual, the exacerbating and relieving factor and severity. These eight points are very important. After these eight points, your 30-40% diagnosis will be made. So sight is important. And with these eight points, you can have also history of associated symptoms and known case or risk factor, like patient is having earlier diabetes, hypertension, any CV stroke, he's smoker, what is his age? gender, that is all are important together to come to a diagnosis and conclude for the chest pain. So first point is site. There are various sites you can see here, the retrosternal site, the chest pain, frontal, central chest pain, we can say that, that chest pain is because of myocardial ischemia, infarction or unstable angina, pericardial pain, esophageal pain, aortic dissection, mediastinal lesion and pulmonary embolism can be retrosternal. Intrascapular backside, myocardial ischemic pain, musculoskeletal pain, gallbladder pancreatic pain can go towards back. Right lower anterior chest pain, there is a site of liver, gallbladder, so diaphragmatic abscess pain, pleurisy, the peripheral part, pulmonary embolism, gastric ulcers, duodenal ulcers are usually right lower anterior uh, acute myositis or injuries. Epigastric pain, again, there is a site of heart, esophagus, duodenum, pancreas, gallbladder, liver, and diaphragmatic and pneumonia can present like that. Shoulder pain, usually a radiating chest pain of cardiac is also comes to the shoulder. Otherwise, subdiaphragmatic abscess, a referred pain may be there. Diaphragmatic pleurisy can be there. Cervical spine disease can give rise to pain there. Acute skeletomuscular disorders, frozen shoulder, thoracic outlet syndrome can give rise to pain at the shoulder. Arm, also a radiation cardiac pain. Otherwise, Cervical, dorsal spine problems, thoracic outlet syndrome can lead to pain at the arm. And left lower anterior chest, that is also neuralgic pain, pulmonary embolism, myositis, pneumonia. What are the structures are there? Come to come to close to that diagnosis. Think of that structures first and then think of some referred structures or radiating pains can be there. So you have to come to the onset, you come to the site, then you come to the quality. Quality of chest pain means there are lots of qualities, sharp pain, stabbing pain, pinprick type of pain, and the typical of cardiac pain is anginal pain. So what is angina? Angina is a severe pain in the chest, will also spreading to the shoulders, arms, and neck, owing to inadequate blood supply to the heart. And this type of chest pain is usually heaviness, squeezing, suffocating type of pain. So that is a particular quality of angina usually. And there is a differentiation in between typical and atypical angina. Angina is usually a steady retrosternal component 
it is provoked by exertion or stress and it is relieved by rest and ntg if all these three uh, three features are there it is called typical angina if out of these three only two or two are there then it's atypical angina it's only one characteristic is fulfilling then it's maybe a non anginal chest pain so uh, some are sometimes in diabetic patient and female patient and elderly patients the angina cannot be present at like a chest pain it was somewhat like burning or aching discomfort or it's only jaw pain arm pain this near and sometimes it's extreme extreme fatigue only so in this scenario you have to be very careful it's uh, cardiac pain or non cardiac pain so these are the feature where angina is very unlikely like sharp ni knife like pain brought on by respiratory movement or cough mostly it is the pleuritic pain pericardial pain or uh, pneumonic pain pain localized by tip of one finger or a localized very pinpoint type of pain that is usually not angina pain reproduced with movement or palpation of the chest well it is usually skeletal muscular or respiratory like the constant pain that persists for many hours and days that looks like angina because angina is episodic very brief episodes of pain that last for seconds is also non anginal pain pain in the lower abdomen and radiates to the lower limbs are usually non anginal so by the time of to taking history you can come to know that pain is cardiac or non cardiac we can discuss more uh, in further slides so whenever the pain is come to in your mind or in your uh, examination part history part you have a word of radiation and refer so remember radiation is the pain which is having a continuous path so cardiac pain can be radiate to the chest to the left arm shoulder jaw arm and it can be a referred pain there is a no central pain but only pain in the shoulder so these are the radiation and referred pain is uh, characteristic they are because the synapses and some temporal summation and lots of neurological phenomena is going on between the thoracic ganglia or sympathetic fiber synapses and dorsal spinal roots so whatever the dorsal spinal roots lower cervical to d6 d5 spinal roots the mechanism what neurological mechanism they can be referred or radiating pain of the cardiac to the different structures so these you have to come to the mind that it's a radiating pain or referred pain is also there now important points are associations chest pain is exacerbating and relieving factor and what are the association it, at which point of time they are coming with eating they are coming after postprandial means after eating it is coming with inspiration it's coming with coughing it is coming with local movements it, it is exacerbating associated are nausea vomiting dyspnea malaise or light headedness so by these points we can differentiate like inspiration expiration then lungs are the first probability eating then gi tract local movements musculoskeletal nausea vomiting then cardiac or can be gi tract dyspnea is lung and cardiac extreme fatigability is cardiac aortic like these type of associations are there with particular points now after the detailed history and eight points you can come to the vital examination vital signs you have to see if all all things are going fine the including the oxygen monitoring is must with the chest pain examination and you don't forget the paler paler because anemia can give rise to the chest pain you have to go through the examination of carotids the pulse is there or not is there any um, volume disturbances from radial to carotid or radial to femoral site the lungs are oscillating well or not cardiac sounds are well or not the thoracic cage is in the proper shape or not abdomen is tender or not peripheral pulses never forgot examine peripheral pulses otherwise you can miss out at dissection sometimes on clinical examination and skin you have to look and after these points you have a some basic investigation in chest pain like ecg chest x ray and blood uh, investigation for cardiac it is cardiac enzymes for gi tract you are amylase lipase liver functions and basic blood profile and routine blood investigation and followed by you can go for a echo usg abdomen ct scan and nuclear imaging chest x ray etc so now after this uh, total history you can conclude that the chest pain is off the wall or some covering structure like pleuritic or pericardial or it's a visceral pain so chest wall pain is usually sharp precisely localized reproducible 
increasing on palpation and movement pleuritic respiratory chest pain is somatic pain it's sharp worse with breathing and coughing and visceral chest pain like cardiac chest pain is not a particularly localized poorly localized aching and heaviness type of chest pain so now after the whole history and examination you can come that the cardiac pain so it may be a myocardial ischemia mi or acute coronary syndrome then vascular if pulses are abnormal dizziness is there pain is going to back then it's aortic dissection pulmonary then pulmonary new uh, embolism pneumothorax pneumonia and pleurisy are the categories which give can give rise to chest pain pericardial or tamponade can give rise to chest pain and esophageal rupture so now all these um, chest pain we can make a one slide of all these differential diagnoses and their particular characteristic one by one going through so acute coronary syndrome i said it's a range of condition which is due to sudden reduced blood flow to the heart because of coronary ischemia reduced blood flow to the heart means coronary ischemia coronary arteries are the arteries which supply the blood vessels supplying blood vessels to the myocardium or heart the blood if they have having narrowing or clotting in that that can leads to a reduced blood flow and resulting is coronary ischemia is resulting in chest pain the terminology used is acute coronary syndrome acute coronary syndrome itself having a terminology uh, sorry range of conditions like stable angina unstable uh, sorry uh, angina unstable angina and non st elevation mi or a uh, st elevation mi so in that condition heart can be damaged or heart cannot be damaged if flow is reduced and ischemia is there there is no necrosis of the myocardium heart is not damaged if your blood reports are positive like troponin and myocardial necrosis features are there rwma on echoes then the heart is damaged and that is called myocardial infarction so differential diagnosis of acs concluding the all these types of chest pain we come to know one by one by slide so myocardial infarction pain or myocardial ischemic pain ongoing is usually retrosternal diffuse heaviness so this is the character and site it's a usually sudden onset radiation to the neck and arm persistent pain for more than 10 to 20 minutes is usually severe patient sick to the hospital immediately associated dyspnea diaphoresis there nausea and it's usually reproducible with the exertion sometimes it's relieved by nitroglycerin and again pain started exertional angina is usually episodic pain usually for 5 to 10 minutes onset with the same kind of exertion resolves with the rest with sub some lingual nitroglycerin tablets or sometimes spray response to exertion and rest follow the same pattern the patient usually say may uh, i am walking on a half an hour a half an kilometer i get a pain i take a rest for 5 minutes it's relieved so same pattern it's exertional stable angina we can say atypical angina usually occurs at red is due to coronary spasm and the pattern remains the same like of anginal pain now what is unstable angina unstable angina is the angina character which is a sudden severe new onset pain or the stable angina which has become more frequent more severe easily provocable now it's only a 10 steps which leads to the anginal chest pain it more difficult to relieve it occurs at rest and lasting for 20 minutes and these are the patients which having high risk of myocardial infarction then so the acute coronary syndrome pain can be a anginal pain can be unstable angina or it can be myocardial infarction pain the characteristic we have discussed now what are the other possibilities when we diagnostic a chest pain of cardiac or other organs which can give rise to or making a differential diagnosis with the chest pain so first an emergency and other condition we can going discussing in slides uh, that is one is pulmonary embolism pulmonary thromboembolism is a very dangerous condition the clotting formed in the lower uh, limbs vessels or abdominal veins that can come to the right atrium right ventricle and then plugged into the pulmonary vessels main pulmonary arteries or their branches in the lungs and then this condition is known to as pulmonary thromboembolism usually that happen after a patient having in prolonged immobilization or fracture surgery of the lower limb trauma cancer patients or there is a some hereditary disorders of the blood can leads to this type of condition pulmonary thromboembolism
So it's the classical presentation of that pulmonary embolism is a sharp pain, dyspnea, tachypnea, tachycardia, and hypoxia. Sometimes only one of the features are there. Chest pain only is there. Dyspnea is only there. Patient only presented with syncope or shock. Sometimes there is fever, cough, and hemoptysis is also associated. So pain is in this condition usually peripheral and a plural quality. Plural pain means sharp stabbing pain, which is localized in the periphery of the chest. And that is reproducible with breathing and palpation. So these type of pain, think of pulmonary embolism. Take associated features like patient having some prolonged immobilization, long travel history in the aeroplane, uh, any fracture, cancer, all the risk factors associated with pulmonary embolism, you have to be careful while taking the history of like that. Now, again, another emergency chest pain is aortic dissection. The patient is also having some atherosclerotic diseases earlier or a hypertension which is uncontrolled. Coarctation of aorta means narrowing of the aorta which is a congenital disorder. The history may be of there. A bicuspid aortic wall. The aortic wall in the heart usually having trileaflet structure. If there is a two leaflet structure, one of the uh, two leaflets are fusion, then it's known as bicuspid aortic wall. This is a congenital disorder. With that bicuspid aortic valve, dissection is common, aortic stenosis, Marfan syndrome with pregnancy, and ullus dandler syndrome, in which what happens, the aortic wall becomes weak. In pregnancy also, it becomes weak. So in these type of conditions, the chances of rupture between the aortic wall, uh, aortic wall, aortic wall means the in, intima, media, and adventitia. Three structures are there, and if there is a one vent happens there, the rupture of atherosclerotic plaque or the shearing force is there and there is a tunnel, a false tunnel made in the aorta that is known as aortic dissection and it can give rise to a severe substernal tearing, ripping chest pain which is radiating to the interscapular area. It can go up to lower limb also, it can go above also. So pain above and below diaphragm, severe also associated in the interscapular area, think of aortic dissection. It is often associated with stroke, uh, MI, and limb ischemia. Together, means cardiac and aortic dissection pain can be there. Now come to the spontaneous pneumothorax. So what are the risk factors for spontaneous pneumothorax? Sudden changes, barometric pressure, heavy exercise, smokers, the blebs or bulla formation on the uh, lungs, idiopathic blebs disease. Patient known case of smoker and COPD come with a sudden chest pain, sharp pleuritic chest pain, again, because of the lungs are involved with dyspnea, low saturation. If you examine, you found absence of breath sounds on the one side, hyper and non-tone percussion, and your X-ray is diagnostic. So these are the characteristic features fit into the pneumothorax. Then esophageal rupture, what is known as Bowerhub syndrome. That is also life-threatening uh, condition after a projectile or a strong forceful vomiting, there may be a tear in the esophagus, which can lead to substernal sharp chest pain, sudden onset, usually after vomiting, dyspnea, diaphoretic, very sick patient, chest x-ray can be normal. They have a subcutaneous emphysema because of the rupture of the esophagus, the air can leak into the subcutaneous spaces also. They have a plural effusion, pneumothorax, pneumomindiastinum together and water soluble contrast study is the uh, a, a part of investigation we can do. Pericardial pain. Pericardial pain, the, there are lots of causes of pericarditis. It can be infective, it can be uremic, uh, something like that. The peri pericardial pain is again a sharp, severe, constant pain and the, it's radiated to the neck, shoulders also. The characteristic feature of pericardial pain is worse with a lying down and inspiration. It works with the lying down and inspiration and relief with the leaning forward because as the patient is lying, there is a more blood flow and more friction of the pericardium and heart. Uh, characteristic finding on examination is friction rub. ECG is showing ST segment elevation throughout T wave inversion and PR per depression particularly. Now, pneumonic pain. Pneumonic pain is again sharp and pleuritic pain associated usually fever and cough. And pain usually increases with coughing. Rails or traps are there, decreased breath sounds are there on a particular pneumonic segment and x-ray is diagnostic. Mitral valve prolapse, that is also a cause of chest pain, which is more common in female. There are associated some features like dizziness, hyperventilation, anxiety, depression, palpitation, ventricular arrhythmias are there. This is the very common condition in females, almost um, 
in hundreds there are five to ten percent uh, peoples are having in sorry in thousands five to ten patients having mitral valve prolapse it's a uh, hanging uh, elongated mitral valve structure which is not uh, closed properly and give rise to straining type of chest pain and very atypical presentation which can be diagnosed by echo musculoskeletal pain or a chest wall disorder pain usually they are localized localized to the particular size site pinpoint sharp they increase by position they are reproducible reproducible by change of posture or uh, pressure the types of this musculoskeletal chest pains are costochondritis stitch syndrome which is known as xiphodine xiphodynia the xiphi sternum the mid bone of our sternum the location <clears throat> between the epigastrium where the xiphoid process is attached to the manubrium striatum lots of patient having a pain in that portion on that bone also that is known as xiphodynia now the gi disorders like uh, peptic ulcer disease gastroesophageal reflux disease and gallbladder pains are can also present like a chest pain so in grd or dyspeptic disorders the pain is like burning character guanine lower retro sternal chest pain sometimes they having irritation or acidic taste also recommended position increases the pain and relief by antacid these type of pain is also confused with, usually confusing with the acute coronary syndrome now there is a esophageal spasm one of the condition which can present as a chest pain that is also sudden onset dull tight gripping pain in the retro sternum they exacerbated by hot and cold liquids large food blows and response to usually nitroglycerin and calcium channel blockers peptic ulcer disease they are the gastric ulcers or duodenal ulcers gastric ulcers pains are usually postprandial immediately happening boring dull aching pain sometimes may awake the patient duodenal ulcer pain same character but relieved after somewhat eating the treatment is again antacid and the differential diagnosis we have to make pancreatitis and biliary tract disorders panic disorders or psychogenic pain they are the recurrent pain recurrent the examination looks bilkul uh, okay investigations are okay and unexpected severe pain and having somewhat other features like palpitation diaphoresis tremors choking nausea dizziness and some uh, neurological symptoms they are usually depressed kind of uh, people or um, loss of self control is there hot flushes is there so in these types of patients you have to rule out the psychological disorders and rule out the substance abuse means heavy smoker uh, ganja taking or alcoholic people they can have a psychogenic pain now after these all uh, differential diagnosis lots of character we have discussed site we have discussed the basic investigations for uh, cardiac chest pain we come to because they are very dangerous type of pain uh ecg we have to do serum markers we have to do and imaging studies we have to do so in ecg there are lots of features with which favoring the acute coronary syndrome like st depression st elevation deep t wave inversion so we come to the another side serum markers we have a cpk mb level created in kinase myo it's myocardial portion then we have a troponin which is a very good test nowadays and imaging studies we have a echo for cardiac pain or a chest x ray for rule out other causes so we come to know in acute coronary syndrome the ecg early may have only in stable angina may be no features in unstable angina acute coronary syndrome the evidence of necrosis are not there because it's a angina only there is no damage so there is no any q wave in the ecg ecg is showing only st depression or t wave inversion the second range of acute coronary syndrome is non st elevation mi means the mi which is not transmular they are st segment depression t wave inversion the positive is evidence of necrosis in the form of troponin the enzyme which is released from the myocardium can detect in the blood so ischemia can lead to injury now and infarction has started and last is the st elevation mi the evidence of necrosis is present and ecg early and late features are also there like st elevation and then late the evolving changes of mi how this happen acute coronary syndrome in the coronary vessels the uh, there is a, uh, the atherosclerotic plaque is there and when that plaque is ruptured 
there is a formation of clot there and the blood vessel is clogged. So this is the ECG finding of one of the acute coronary syndrome. You can see in 2, 3 AVF, there is a ST elevation with going upwards. So this is a typical of inferior wall MI, acute coronary syndrome, inferior wall MI. This is an ECG in which ST elevation you can see in 1 AVL and V2, V4. This is a typical with reciprocal changes in 2, 3 AVF. You can see ST depression. So this is a acute coronary syndrome, anterior wall MI. ECG finding um, in again ACS, there is again V2, V4, ST elevation, anterior wall MI, and then the evolving late changes in the V1 to V4, the deep T inversion. So these are the coronary imaging features. The You can see the narrowed lumen of the LAD, the left anterior descending artery. So these are the more ECGs. So cardiac enzymes, when chest pain comes to you, you can, uh, by history, can find out that this can be a cardiac pain, but ECG is not having significant changes and you can advise some blood investigation in the form of troponin. So there is a, a time gap between they can raise. So they start appearing in blood in two to six hours and can take a peak up to eight to 10 hours. So you have to repeat sometime the troponin and you can come to know that is it's cardiac chest pain or not. Doing troponin is also to rule out the cardiac chest pain is important. Usually in the routine practice, we are doing CPKMB and troponin nowadays and other cardiac markers are not used regularly. So in your OPD or emergency, if patient comes to you with a sudden uh, chest pain, which is a cardiac pain, you have to... It's a definite ACS by rule out other features, by character of the history, by examination, by ECG. If you rule out other causes and you find that this is a definite ACS, then you have to uh, go by, if there is a ST elevation MI, you have to follow the protocol of the next speaker. Okay, if there is no ST elevation MI and chest pain markers are there, you have to intervene accordingly. The ongoing chest pain is there, troponin, how much is raised, is there is arrhythmia, high-risk features are there or not. If there is a no definite ACS, possible ACS, you can repeat your biomarker and ECG and you can see for the dynamic changes in the ECG and you can come to know that there is no changes, even biomarkers or a troponin repeat after eight or 10 hours is negative, then you, you have to give some symptomatic medication and do a stress test to find out that is a cardiac pain or not. And if there is a recurrent pain and your troponin after four, eight hours comes positive, you have to go with coronary angiography, that kind of chest pain. Now, some case studies, I, according, we have discussed lots of about the chest pain. And uh, now we have a short of time also going fast, 70 years main, male, 10 days post CABG developed acute dyspnea, right-sided chest pain on awakening, examination relieved tachypnea, hypoxia, X-ray looks normal. So post-surgery, acute chest pain with dyspnea and low saturation, think of pulmonary embolism. Per perfusion lung scan or CT pulmonary angiography is diagnostic. Nine, 49 years male with long-standing uh, cardiovascular, hypertensive cardiovascular diseases, sudden mid-back pain associated with nausea, sweat, unrelieved by change of posture, radiation to the left chest. X-ray is showing somewhat widening of the mediastinum. The diagnosis can be a aortic dissection. Don't miss the peripheral pulses examination. Wrestler with a chest pain, 18 years. Wrestler, right side chest pain while pinning his opponent. Decreased breath sound on the right side. You can see X-rays having pneumothorax. Alcoholic with fever chills, productive cough. X-ray showing pneumonia on your right lung. Smoker's chest, pneumothorax with collapse consolidation. This is the X-ray. So ultimately chest pain, if you come to know, come in your OPD or emergency, find out first cardiac, non-cardiac, in cardiac ischemic or non-ischemic, ischemic angina, unstable angina, myocardial infection, non-ischemic pericardiality, myocarditis. Chest pain come to, it's a GI tract related disorder or non-GI tract related disorder and uh, go by history. So ischemic ischemic cardiac chest pain again the eight features are there central diffuse jaw neck tight squeezing choking 
precipitated by exertion motion there is usually a ischemic cardiac pain associated with breathlessness response to nitrates non cardiac chest pain are peripheral other qualities sharp stabbing pin prick spontaneous not relieved they are usually non cardiac pain so these are the emergency situations which have already we have discussed with their relevant investigations nitrous response is not diagnostic every pain which is relieved by nitroglycerin is not cardiac chest pain sharp pain are qualifiers postprandial pain may be ischemic don't forget gi symptoms are there with the inferior wall mi nausea vomiting only the features dizziness discomfort thresholds can vary patient histories may influence you atypical is usually typical of something and value of careful history and physical examination don't for do thank you very much uh, dr sharma we have a few queries for you uh, okay. one of one of them being uh, about angina equivalence one of the students wants to know whether dyspnea is an angina equivalent yes yes dyspnea sudden onset of dyspnea is can be angina equivalent if we find no another cause of dyspnea it can be angina equivalent in diabetic elderly or female patient we have to treat like that if we don't found any another cause of dyspnea okay there is one more query about silent myocardial infarctions could you just tell us something yeah, about yeah silent that? myocardial infarction is very common in diabetic patients elderly females and um, uh, patients who are taking steroids or immunocompromised uh, host they are having a silent myocardial infarction in which they have uh, got infected and after the complication can present them like lv dysfunction already sets in and they present with ccf and all this and when we evaluate them we found ecg and eco are abnormal or, or they have a very atypical symptoms like uh, perspiration and dyspnea with the presentation so silent mi possible okay thank you very much thank you for your very enlightening talk and uh, thank you for sparing your valuable time for giving us this talk our next speaker is uh, a very familiar face in parul hospital our very own interventional cardiologist dr sanket he will be talking on uh, management of acute myocardial infarction over to you dr sanket uh hello everyone good evening uh, uh dr krishna khan has uh, taken a detailed and very good uh, speak uh, talk on uh, approach to chest pain so now continuing our cardiac discussion i would like to uh, help you out regarding management of acute myocardial infarction uh, see uh, acute myocardial infarction is one of the most common emergencies which any uh, doctor in his or her practice would encounter it is a very uh, uh, stressful disease it has a very uh, negative impact both financial as well as mental on the patient as well as the family so uh, it is very important that all of us are uh, all of us at least know the basics how to treat a patient coming to you with an acute myocardial infarction first of all uh, as dr krishna kanth has told uh, there is a wide variety of coronary syndrome uh, there is a coronary artery disease with stable angina there is an unstable angina there is a non st segment elevation myocardial infarction and st segment elevation myocardial infarction our point of discussion today would be purely on management of acute stemi so uh, for the diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction at least three at least two of the following three features are essential that is a very characteristic chest pain uh, the very uh, classical ecg changes and elevated cardiac enzyme however patients might sometimes not exactly describe may not may not might not be able to exactly describe the chest pain there might be some difficulties in getting an ecg at the right time and troponins uh, are little expensive so might not be available everywhere so there are caveats to all these things but still these two of the three findings are very essential universal definition of myocardial infarction there are basically five types of myocardial infarction type 1 is an acute coronary myocardial injury due to coronary rupture or erosion and associated thrombosis type 2 is is actually known as secondary myocardial infarction or it is primarily because of imbalance between the oxygen supply and demand so maybe because of various reasons the most common being anemia or any uh, stress on the body can lead to the imbalance type 3 is a person who has a sudden death 
where you did not have adequate time to at least draw the troponins or get an ecg but the evidence of mi was shown on autopsy type 4 has a and b type a is uh, actually type 4 is peri procedural myocardial infarction type a is post pci or percutaneous coronary intervention uh, mi and type 4 b is stent thrombosis type 5 is myocardial infarction uh, peri operative means peri cabg so uh, based on that you first of all decide whether your patient has myocardial infarction or not it is very important because stemi comprises of about 33% of all acs cases diagnosis as we all know is based on typical st elevation changes seen on the ecg what is the basic pathophysiology responsible for stemi is an acute thrombotic occlusion of an epicardial coronary artery stemi requires a very prompt recognition based on the features based on ecg based on the cardiac enzymes it requires a very good risk stratification means which patients need the treatment earliest possible and what are the different modes of management you apply depending on the uh, risk factors and earliest possible treatment the best treatment possible is reperfusion these are few examples of ecg where you see st segment here you can see st elevation in uh, lead 2 3 and avf with reciprocal st depressions in anterior chest lead so this is a very typical inferior wall st elevation myocardial infarction this is another ecg where you can see st elevations from v1 to v5 one and avl with reciprocal st depression in 2 3 and avs so very very typical st segment elevation anterior wall myocardial infarction so a patient presenting with classical chest pain or maybe a atypical angina or an angina mimic with such an ecg definitely it is an st elevation myocardial infarction so now you risk stratify the patient there are various tools available uh, most commonly used are timi risk score grace risk score but all these risk scores basically give the mortality rates there is one classification known as kilip classification which actually helps though it gives uh, the mortality rates also but it also helps you manage the patient so based on which category the patient is in uh, sometimes your modality of treatment might differ so there, there are basically there are four classifications in kilip class 1 is this patient who doesn't have any heart failure or there are no crepitations or there is no third heart sound mortality classically has been shown to be around 6% in such patients kilips class 2 is patient class 2 onwards patients have heart failure but in class 2 patients uh, will have crepitations in the lung uh, fields but it would be less than 50% of the lung fields plus there would be a third heart sound mortality in such groups is around 17% class 3 is severe heart failure there is frank pulmonary edema with crepitations heard in more than half of the lung fields it has a high mortality rate about 38% but still till till the stage 3 uh, the blood pressures and uh, is holding up so class 4 is cardiogenic shock where you have signs of hypotension where, which is systolic blood pressure should be less than or equal to 90 mm of mercury and there is evidence of peripheral vasoconstriction and there is severe heart failure so you need to find out which classification which class of this kilip class your patient fits in then again why you need to treat this patients early see we all know the uh, myocardium which is the muscle of the heart which is primarily responsible for pumping of the heart and enough cardiac output is very sensitive so once the blood supply to myocardium decreases each minute the no- amount of damage to myocardium increases and it is and it increases to an ex- uh, in an exponential way so the earlier you treat the better the outcomes are there for the patient second thing earlier you treat the more amount of myocardium you would be able to uh, uh, there would be more amount of viable myocardium which uh, indirectly uh, tells you that the amount of damage in the heart would be very less as early you treat and the most important thing uh, mi has a range of very uh, bad complications so earlier you treat the lesser the complications in such patients so basically what are the targets of your treatment most important is a pain relief uh, because of the pain of stemi there is sympathetic hyperactivity which again leads to tachycardia and there is more oxygen demand so somewhere you need to break the cycle the most important part of the treatment of mi is pain relief then you have to restore the oxygen supply and demand imbalance which has occurred and 
if at all there are any complications you should take those early should try to prevent those complications and if any complication has happened you should treat as early as possible so basic things uh, so we first start with an uh, oxygen basically whenever a patient with mi has a normal saturation oxygen is not required oxygen is required only in patients who are very breathless or hypoxic means that oxygen saturation is 90 less than 90% or who present with heart failure uh, ideally you should start with either a nasal uh, uh, you can start with nasal mask or a nasal cannula if the saturation is improved you can come down on an oxygen because it is it has been seen the higher concentration of oxygen may actually cause coronary vasoconstriction also so person with normal saturation might not require oxygen aspirin the corner store of treatment of myocardial infarction whenever you have a stemi with you earliest possible you should give the person aspirin either from dose ranging from 162 to 325 mg it should be ideally chewed it should be a non enteric formulation because uh, chewing a non enteric formulation will help absorption of the aspirin earliest possible patients who are who are having history of aspirin allergy and who have uh, uh, in, uh, statin intolerance should also receive uh, aspirin as early as possible chewable aspirin is preferred as this uh, prompts rapid absorption into blood stream to achieve faster therapeutic levels then the next comes nitrates so uh, nitrates as we all know are potent vasodilators they dilate veins as well as arteries so by their veno dilating action what do they do is they decrease the venous return to the heart so in uh, so in that way they decrease the heart uh, preload to the heart and decreases the uh, function of the heart so basically it helps to reduce oxygen demand also they are known to be arterial dilators that means they act on coronary arteries they can actually dilate the coronary arteries and somehow it ha- helps increasing the blood supply to the coronary arteries the mo- uh, routes which we can use nitrates are either sublingual or intravenous infusion many patients uh, who might be having unstable angina or chronic stable angina might be already on nitrates they might be knowing that whenever they have a severe chest pain they should put uh, sublingually one tablet of nitrate nitroglycerin uh, they can take maximum of 3 tablets at an interval of minimum 5 to 10 minutes not more than that because if they keep on taking nitrate sublingually there is a tendency that the patient might have severe hypotension so maximum 3 tablets at an interval of 5 to 10 minutes is allowed very severe chest pain not responding to oral uh, sublingual nitrates they might need intravenous infusion of nitrate nitroglycerin Uh, we can start with 5 to 10 microgram per minute of infusion and we can dilate it accordingly to the blood pressures it helps in reducing oxygen demand as well as it reduces the pain by its dilator action where nitrates are not to be used especially when you have an rv infarction either isolated or in association with inferior wall mi patients with hypotension or severe bradycardia we should avoid giving nitrates to such patients oral or sublingual nitrates might cause headache in some patients and some patients might suffer very severe headaches also with the patient with the nitrate few cases morphine helps for uh, pain relief if the person has a very severe refractory or severe ongoing chest pain which is not responding to any other medications morphine has been used uh, it has a very uh, toxic profile uh, nowadays it is not very much used also uh, uh, many patients develop toxic symptoms because of morphine also respiratory depression also happens in case there is severe toxicity there is an antagonist known as naloxon also for morphine so these this till now you had managed your patient in an uh, say in an emergency ward where you you have given uh, emergency treatment now comes your main uh, line of treatment that is reperfusion so now everything depends on the interval from the onset of chest pain and uh, first medical contact and the time to reach the medical facility so basically there are two types of uh, two strategies for reperfusion it is either a pharmacological reperfusion that is fibrinolysis or a mechanical reperfusion that is primary percutaneous coronary intervention also known as primary pca so there are guidelines given by both american heart association as well as european society 
also there are some indian guidelines to simplify i would uh, like to tell you uh, from an european point of view this schematic diagram shows that the moment the person has a chest pain the person should immediately contact a hospital or an ambulance facility like a 108 in gujarat the time uh, the least the time between the first medical contact better outcomes are there then second point is taking an ecg or at least making a diagnosis of stemi the time interval between the first medical contact and the time of diagnosis stemi diagnosis should ideally be less than 10 minutes whichever place they go either it is to a hospital or to an ambulance the time interval between the first medical contact and a diagnosis of stemi should ideally be less than 10 minutes so now there will be three scenarios first is if the person reaches directly to a facility where primary pci is available there and within 10 minutes if the person is diagnosed to have a stemi the treatment or the reperfusion strategy of choice would be primary pci uh, done at that place and ideally within 60 minutes you should be able to open up the uh, closed or occluded artery second option is if the person reaches at a hospital which is actually non pci center means pci facility is not possible over there then again within 10 minutes the diagnosis should be made then you decide whether you can reach the pci capable center within 2 hours or not if it is not possible to reach there within 2 hours fibrinolysis that is thrombolysis would be the strategy of choice and ideally it should be started within 10 minutes of the uh, arriving at the hospital if the person can be shifted to a facility where you can do a primary pci within 2 hours try referring that patient to that place and the time interval from coming to the hospital first medical hospital to your uh, opening of the artery should be ideally within less than 30 uh, sorry 19 minutes okay third scenario is where the person has contacted 108 ambulance and again the same condition applies as the person has gone to a non pci capable center uh, these are all ideal scenarios same timings and same things are not possible in indian conditions there are many factors most common is uh, starting from person recognizing in symptoms then contacting the medical facility getting an ecg done at each Uh, juncture there are multiple reasons for delay most importantly the most important uh, reason is always financial so maintaining the time durations is actually difficult but we should try to minimize the delays as much as possible why i am repeatedly telling you about time uh, because which is shown in this uh, diagram it is known as a wave front phenomenon of ischemic cell death you can see the first diagram where upper area that is dark red is the normal region below is the pink region which is actually having ischemia this is 15 minutes after onset of chest pain at 40 minutes you can see a yellow area developing in the ischemic zone that is the necrosis happening it progresses so fast that in within 30 hours almost more than 60% of the ischemic area has become necrotic and by 6 hours almost 80 to 90% has become necrotic so the earlier you treat the maximum chances of you surviving the myocardium once it necro it becomes necros it is dead so it cannot function and that leads to decreased ejection fraction of the heart so now the true strategies the first is primary pci so primary pci has been shown to achieve superior reperfusion outcomes why because we are seeing with our eyes there which arteries occluded and we can do dedicated infarct related arterial revascularization plus it is associated with less complications less deaths and less long term complications which are possible with fibrinolytic therapy so current guidelines what do they say that if the patient presents to you within 20, within 12 hours of onset of symptoms and other groups are who have cardiogenic shock or who have acute severe heart failure these patients ideally first line of treatment should be primary pci if it is available also patients after 12 hours means 12 to 24 hours after onset of symptoms still they deserve a primary pci if they have ongoing clinical or ecg evidence of ongoing myocardial ischemia so primary pci is always whenever available first treatment of choice 
However, it might not always be possible. So you should always be ready with your fibrinol lysis. So what is the, as I told you, the basic pathophysiology behind STEMI is plaque rupture and thrombus formation. So fibrinolytic therapy was developed to break this thrombus. So 90% of cases which are because of plaque rupture can be treated with fibrinol lysis. It still remains a very viable option, especially in Indian conditions where the availability of primary PCI might be very limited. So how do these uh, drugs work? They have a very common mechanism of converting the proenzyme plasminogen to an active enzyme that is plasmin, which actually lyses the clot. Okay. So it is capable of breaking down fibrin as well as fibrinogen. So the, it depends upon how specific the agent acts on fibrin and depending upon that, uh, the side effects and its efficacy is determined. So for example, we have two groups of uh, fibrinolytic agents. One is fibrin non-specific, which has been used since years and it's, which has the largest amount of uh, experience with uh, all doctors that is streptokinase. It is not fibrin specific. That means it acts on the occluded artery, but it can act at other places also. That's why the bleeding profile, that is side effect profile of streptokinase is much more as compared to other agents. It is antigenic also. So that is why once you give streptokinase, you cannot reuse within the next one or two years. Otherwise it can cause anaphylaxis sometimes. And the dose to be given is 1.5 million units IV over 30 to 60 minutes. We have available fibrin specific agents. These are ultiplase, retiplase and tenectiplase. All these are fibrin specific means they act on the thrombus, which is there in the coronary artery. Or for say, even if it is used in stroke, wherever the thrombus is formed, it acts specifically over there. They don't have antigenic reactions and their efficacy is far better as compared to streptokinase. But only problem is they are far more expensive as compared to streptokinase. So these are the dose of uh, various fibrinolytic agents we use. Streptokinase is 1.5 million units given over 30 to 60 minutes. Ultiplase is 15 milligram bolus. Then you have to give a 0.75 milligram per kg over 30 minutes and then 0.5 milligram per kg over the next, uh, next 60 minutes. Retiplase is given as a double bolus, 10 units over two minutes and then a repeat 10 units after 30 minutes. And tenacity place has a weight based regimen, single bolus. So uh, what do guidelines say? Guidelines say whenever primary PCI is not available, you should thrombolyze the patient, use fibrin specific thrombolytic agents if possible. Uh, three of them, which I've told you, ultiplase, retiplase and tenectiplase. Tenectiplase is considered to the, be the best of these three because multiple reasons, because it has fibrin, more, uh, most fibrin specific, least antigenic and single bolus, so it is very easily given. But, uh, and it is, uh, it, it has to be started as soon as possible, when if, earliest possible, whenever the patient comes in your contact, it should be started as soon as possible. And once you thrombolyze, there are various modalities available. There are various modalities. If you don't do primary PCI, there are other options like facilitated PCI. If, the, if you can thrombolyze the patient at your facility, and if you feel that now the patient is stable, then you can send the patient for a PCI. So once you thrombolyze the patient, stabilize the patient, and then if you send the patient for PCI, it is known as facilitated PCI. You are facilitating the procedure. There are certain groups of patients where they do not respond to fibrinolysis. So they are called failed thrombolysis. What does failed thrombolysis mean is either the pain has not subsided or it has increased the ECG changes, that is ST elevation has not reduced more than 50% or the patient has another hemodynamic compromise like uh, severe uh, shock and patient is not responding to other modalities of treatment. So that is when, ha when that happens, you have to shift the patient for PCI immediately if it is available. That is known as rescue PCI. Okay, so there are two other uh, things like after, uh, apart from primary PCI, that is rescue PCI when your thrombolysis has failed and a facilitated PCI when you electively send the patient for a PCI after thrombolysis. There are certain contraindications to fibrinolytic therapy which you should always consider before starting any thrombolysis. There are certain absolute contraindications like any prior intracranial hemorrhage, any known cerebral lesions like arteriovascular malformations, any malignant uh, intracranial neoplasm. If there was an ischemic stroke within the three months, except 
it has happened within the last four to five hours. If there is suspected aortic dissection, if there is active bleeding, if if there is a facial or head closed trauma within the last three months, severe hypertension. If the blood pressure is more than two hundred, you should not consider thrombolysis. And most importantly, for streptokinase, if prior streptokinase is was used within the last six months, there are certain relative contraindications. Most com most important of those is always you start your thrombolysis once the blood pressure is less than one eighty. Never start it unless and you should try to aggressively control this blood pressure because at pressures more than one eighty, there are chances that the person might develop intracranial hemorrhage. And uh, there are few other relative contraindications. There are side effects possible with fibrinolytics are most common is bleeding, but uh, but the less more fibrin specific it is, the lesser the chances of bleeding. Uh, streptokinase, as we all know, is fibrin non-specific. Uh, variety of side effects, uh, variety of bleeding complications like intracranial hemorrhage, uh, gastrointestinal bleeding, uh, you, uh, genitourinary bleeding uh, can happen, and sometimes it might be very disastrous. Hypersensitivity is again very common with uh, uh, streptokinase and very unusual with other fibrin-specific uh, agents and hypotension. So. indications for the fibrinolytic therapy when you have anticipated that a more than 120 minutes delay is going to happen from the first medical contact to primary pci so if the duration of symptoms is less than 12 hours it is class 1 indication if the duration of chest pain is more than 12 hours still you can send the patient for, still you can thrombolyze the patient considering that if the person is very sick and there is a very large mi which has happened to him and where you should not thrombolyze is non st elevation mi and when there are st depressions so that is class 3 you should never thrombolyze such patients unless you know that it is a true posterior wall mi where you see only st depression in v1 to v4 there is no st elevation but there is only st depression in v1 to v4 which is actually a mirror image of uh, mirror image which is seen in posterior wall mi so up once you have thrombolyzed the patients what are the adjunctive treatments uh, which uh, which you should start so most importantly anticoagulants uh, either heparin or low molecular weight heparin heparin weight adjusted either in an infusion or as bolus doses should be started and should be continued for at least 3 to 5 days in such patients that prevents your uh, uh, thrombosis in uh, and clot formation and peripheral embolization antiplatelets most important part of your treatment as i already told aspirin loading dose to be given along with that one more antiplatelet has to be given it is known as dual antiplatelet strategy so the second antiplatelet can be a p2 y12 antagonist like clopidogrel prasugrel or ticagrelor so loading dose of those antiplatelets should be given at presentation and these dual antiplatelets in maintenance dose should be continued life long statins again uh, loading dose has to be given on presentation and it has to be continued statins have shown to decrease uh, future events in myocardial infarction patients by controlling the cholesterol levels beta blockers beta blockers form a very important part of management because they reduce the heart rate in that way they decrease the oxygen demand also they uh, help in remodeling so it prevent re head was remodeling and it helps in maintaining a good level of uh, oxygen uh, supply and demand ratio ac inhibitors and arbs in various studies they have shown to prevent adverse remodeling happening in the heart after an mi so these drugs should be started at the second or third day or at least before discharge and these are to be continued should avoid giving such medications when the patient is then has a tendency to hypotension like if the pressures are persistently less than 90 mm of mercury should try avoiding this medication diuretics especially aldosterone and aconist spironolactone also have shown to reduce uh, mortality rates and as well as they have shown to prevent adverse remodeling in such patients so this also forms an important part most important they should stop all types of addictions and rest for at least 3 or 5 days is very important what are the possible complications it can be divided into mechanical electrical inflammatory and thrombogenic the most disastrous of such complications are cardiogenic shock or uh, cardiac structure or an ventricular complications like ventricular 
should be diagnosed earliest possible and they should be treated earlier possible otherwise they, sometimes they might uh, uh, turn out to be very uh, uh, life threatening uh, last i would try to uh, 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 summarize with an case example see you have a 50 year male came to you with history of chest pain and dyspnea since the last 3 hours on examination his pulse rate is about 110 mm uh, per minute which is regular blood pressures in supine position are 90 by 60 uh, mm of mercury the respiratory rate is 40 per minute he has on respiratory examination by a bilateral basal crepes but it is less than half uh, less than 50% of the lung fields on cvc examination you have a systolic murmur at the apex saturations are 90% at room air so from this information you know that the patient is in heart failure and he is in cardiogenic shock because his blood pressure is 90 by 60 this is his ecg we can see st elevation in v1 to v5 with reciprocal depressions in 2 3 wave so it is an anterior wall myocardial infarction semi with heart failure with cardiogenic shock so what uh, from this discussion what to know is you should give oxygen because the saturation is 90% patient's respiratory rate is more than 40 per minute that means he is in failure he might require ventilation or at least a bipap or an invasive ventilation nitrates are to be avoided in such patients why because the patient's blood pressure is 90 mm of mercury so he is in hypotension he is in kilips class 4 because although he has less than 50% of krebs in lung field but he has cardiogenic shock so he comes into class 4 so very high mortality risk and most important this patient if you have a primary pca facility we should always go for a primary pca multiple reasons because he is in shock he is in heart failure so primary pca would have a better outcome as compared to fibrinolysis but still if you do not have a primary pca facility or if the chances of shifting him the time gap is more than 120 minutes you should always thrombolyze such patient with adequate cover of inotropes and ventilation so that uh, can open up the artery whatever uh, flow he can achieve it will help him to go for a facilitated pca so with that i conclude uh, if uh, there are any questions i would invite thank you thank you very much dr sanket there is one question uh, we all know about the golden period that is one or two hours what if a patient comes after 6 hours and up to 24 hours do we still go ahead with thrombolysis yes that's what i told up to 6 hours we can thrombol uh, up to 12 hours if you do not have primary pca facility you can thrombolyze the patient okay, okay. but ideally if you have any uh, if you have facility with you for doing primary pca that always should be a first modality of treatment as in when the duration increases the uh, chances of your thrombolysis being successful go on reducing so if a person who comes to you within 3 hours and a person who comes to you at 6 hours the benefit which these two patients will get will be different the person presenting within 3 hours will always benefit more from thrombolysis as compared to person who comes at 6 hours so we should consider it till 12 hours isn't it dr sanket uh, sorry i didn't get you madam we should consider uh, thrombolysis up to 12 hours uh, window period yes yes we can continue from we can thrombolyze the patient even up to 12 hours mm -hmm. if you cannot shift the patient from a for a primary pca facility within 2 hours that is the most important point mm -hmm. if still you are able to shift him to the pca facility and there also if they can take up the patient immediately if all finances and all matters are sorted sorted out and if there is an assurance that he would be uh, in the cath lab and the procedure uh, means the artery would be opened within 2 hours then you should sign if you have all this reassurance otherwise thrombolyzing the patient is a wiser option okay. there is one more question a little unrelated uh, in certain hypertensive patients we find who come in with uncontrolled hypertension they do come in with chest pain and sometimes that subsides as soon as the blood pressure is controlled uh, what would uh, the approach be in such a patient uh, see the as uh, i think hello Yes, yes, we can hear you, Doctor Sanjay. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear yes, you. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, as Doctor Krishna Kant has told, the chest pain can be because of many reasons. In hypertension, what happens is there is a uh, systolic overload in the heart or a diastolic overload. So, because of that, 
the perfusion in the coronary arteries decrease which actually decrease uh, which actually causes pain so the pain is not exactly because of i'm sorry i think we've lost uh, you i think uh, every <laughs> chest pain uh, is considered as acute coronary syndrome you have to look for ecg changes and cardiac markers in hypertension what happens that after load is more so there is a supply demand mismatch which leads to chest pain leading to coronary ischemia so you have to control the blood pressure and look for any myocardial damage is developing or not if it is not developing the the chest pain is due to hypertension only that is can called hypertensive angina okay. okay but we should evaluate such a yeah case. you have to be careful you have to be watch for dynamic ecg changes and you can go for cardiac markers uh, and look for any evidence of uh, injury to the heart okay. thank you very much uh, dr sharma and dr sanket it was a very lovely talk thank you very much with that we conclude this webinar thank you ma'am thank you thank, thank you, you so much. Bye, Sanket. Bye.